If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. Next week, I will be covering Luke chapter 2, and we will be looking at the birth of Jesus Christ. But today, I like to talk to you about wise men still seek him. Wise men still seek him. It is one of my favorite parts of the Christmas story. Let me give you the outline. Number one, God's divine guidance. God's divine guidance. And if you have a bulletin and want to follow along with us, uh, please do. Number two, God's divine protection. Folks, we are under the divine protection of God. We are under the divine protection of God as Christians. And number three, wise men's true worship. Folks, we come here not just to go to church today. I hope we came here wanting to worship our Lord and Savior. Our Lord and Savior is worthy of our worship, folks, and we are going to be talking about that here in just a few minutes. You know, in our text today, we see three reactions to the birth of Christ. First, we see Herod, who was hostile towards his birth. He wanted to be king of the Jews and would even try to kill baby Jesus. The second response to Jesus' birth was from the chief priests who were indifferent towards Jesus. And that's just an amazing thing to me, knowing uh, that they were basically five miles from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, but yet they would not go see Jesus and they would not, not acknowledge Jesus for who he was. And then also the third response was from the wise men. They searched for and found baby Jesus, worshipped him, and gave him gifts. My prayer today is that you will see Jesus for who he is and what he has done for you and truly worship him this Christmas season. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, God's divine guidance. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in the days of Herod the king, Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? And we realize that a lot of times when you see the manger scene and the gifts given then, uh, but truly it was after that. You will see later on it was, they were already in a, in a house. All right, So this could be anywhere from six months uh, to a year after the birth of Christ. And the wise men came from Babylon. Okay, they uh, studied the stars, astronomy. Uh, they they really uh, were intelligent men. Uh, they were scholars. They were wealthy. Uh, they were Gentiles, but yet they had this uh, great desire, the great desire to find Jesus, the in the birthplace of Jesus, and they were asking questions around. And you have to understand, these folks were from a different nation. They were well-dressed. They say there were three wise men, but uh, there's indication there could have been anywhere from 10 to 15 people with them. So to pick them out and to see them, you would think, who are these foreigners and why are they here? They would stick out in uh, that place, in in Bethlehem. It says, where is he uh, who has been born king of the Jews, for we have seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. And folks, I am telling you, when you see light and when you see a star, I'll tell you right now, folks, the star of stars is Jesus Christ himself. He is the bright and morning star. And there were over 300 prophecies 300 prophecies in the Old Testament which spoke of the birth of Jesus. In our text today, you will see four of those prophecies fulfilled. So even at that, you can see how true the Word of God is. It's not a fairy tale, folks. Jesus was born of a virgin. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And and these folks, these... these, uh, uh, Kings and the Magi and the wise men were looking for baby Jesus. In Exodus, hold your finger there and go to Exodus 13. I want to talk to you about God's divine guidance. 
Exodus chapter 13. And if you look here, this is where the children of Israel were leaving Egypt. All right, leaving Egypt. It says in verse 17, Then it came to pass, uh, Exodus 13, 17, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God uh, did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, which would have been closer, but again more dangerous, although that was near. For God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds, and, and when they see war, it returned to Egypt. So God led them the way, around the way, in the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had placed the children of Israel under a solemn oath, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry my bones up from here. And we know that uh, Joseph had died uh, in Egypt, and he did not want to be buried in Egypt. He wanted to be buried uh, with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And so he, he made him promise, uh, he made his family promise that that would take place. So they took their journey from Succoth and encamped at Etham at the edge of the wilderness. Now here it is, verse 21, And the Lord went before them by day, uh, by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pil pillar of cloud, of fire to give them light. This is the first you see in the Old Testament of God guiding his children. And folks, God guides us today. It's not a, it's not a cloud. It's not a fire. Folks, it's the Holy Spirit. And that star was a special star. These, these wise men had studied that. And even the Holy Spirit back then Put it in their hearts. Hey, this is about the time of the birth of Christ. We know by Old Testament prophecy uh, where he is to be born, and I'll show you that in just a minute. In verse 22, And he did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So way back when, way back in Exodus, God was leading his people. And folks, he guides us Christians. We're, we're not just left alone. We can find God's will for our life if we will listen to the voice of God. Then one other thing I want you to see in Daniel chapter 2. Look in Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 verse 48. Daniel chapter 2, 48. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts. And he made him ruler over the whole providence of Babylon and the chief administrator of all the wise men of Babylon. So it tells us in Scripture that Daniel had an influence over the wise men. And so that was passed down in history. And that's how these wise men in our text knew about what was happening in Bethlehem. Daniel had shared uh, the prophecy of Jesus with them. And they were looking for that coming Messiah. And folks, it's amazing because there was 600 years difference in these two occasions and these two things that had happened. So we see God's guiding these wise men. Men. The second thing I want you to see, not only God's divine guidance, but God's divine protection. Look at verse 3. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. Why was he troubled? Because, folks, he was really paranoid. He really was. He was thinking, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be a king of the Jews, even though he wasn't Jewish. He was from the Edomites, but he married a Judas, uh, married uh, a Jew. And by the way, he, he was married, they, history tells us, as many as nine times. Okay? Herod was not a good person. One of his wives and their two brothers he had put to death because he thought they were trying to take over the kingdom. And if he got on your if you got on his bad side, folks, I'm telling you, you wouldn't live. He was Herod the Great. He was, he was ruthless. He was a murderer. 
He was a liar in all these things. And he was troubled because of this news and this caravan of wise men that had come uh, to Jerusalem. Verse 4, And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet, and, and again, this is Micah chapter 5, verse 2, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. And we have to understand, Bethlehem means house of bread. And Jesus would be the bread of life. And Bethlehem was a small town. It was a small town compared to Jerusalem. For out of you shall come a ruler who will, be she- who will shepherd my people Israel. And again, the prophet Micah was saying, uh, talking the prophecy of Jesus being the coming Messiah. Then verse 7, Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring uh, back word to me that I may come and worship him also. Folks, Herod uh, was truly, I I mean, he was just lying, uh, you know, through his teeth. He did not want to come worship him. Folks, he wanted to kill baby Jesus. And that was how, uh, how mean he was. That was how paranoid he was. And, and he was trying to talk to the wise men, but folks, they had enough sense to know and to sense the Holy Spirit, I believe, was speaking to these wise men. And, and while Herod was trying to kill uh, baby Jesus, the, the wise men simply wanted to find baby Jesus. Now skip down to verse 13. We're talking about God's divine protection. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you the word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. So God was even guiding uh, Mary and Joseph, and God was telling them it's not safe to stay here. You must take this young baby. You must take this young child and flee to Egypt. Another prophecy, Old Testament prophecy. Verse 14, and when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed Egypt. That tells you how dangerous it was. That tells you that he snuck out of town by night, not wanting anybody to know who they were or where they were going. And there was until the death of Herod, and, and, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. Another prophecy from Hosea 11, verse 1. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly anger. Folks, he had angry, anger issues. He really did. And he sent forth and put to death all the mill children who were in Bethlehem in all its districts from two years old and under. Can you imagine What a deranged mind Herod had. Folks, I'm telling you, Satan influenced him greatly. He had the babies in Bethlehem, in that region, put to death. What a travesty. According to the time which he had determined from the wise men, then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, the prophet saying, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. What was he saying? What is the Scripture saying? That it was, when you think about it, Rachel died giving childbirth, and it was in Bethlehem that she had died. And, and he, you know, uh, Joseph was uh, just, heart, excuse me, Jacob was heartbroken about that. And he's comparing Jeremiah to the the Babylonian captivity that they would be in later on. And he's comparing that loss 
And folks, we know what it's like. We've seen people lose a spouse. And it is heartbreaking. It is, it is crushing. It's probably one of the hardest things people will go through. And that kind of mourning was going on in Bethlehem because these innocent children and babies were killed. Then verse 19, Now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in him a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the young child's life are dead. Now do you see all the way through this scripture, we see God guiding them, and we see Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus under the divine protection of God. But when he had heard that Archaeus was reigning over Judah, and that was one of Herod's sons, instead his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, and being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. So we see through all this process, I mean, it's fulfilled. Four prophecies have been fulfilled in Scripture, in, in, in our Scripture here. So we see the divine protection of God. And the last thing I want you to see, not only God's divine guidance, not only God's divine protection, but the wise men's true worship. Look at verse 9. And when they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And you, we can see in Scripture that that star guided these wise men to Jesus' house. And there's indication in Scripture that that star wasn't always visible. They would see the star and they would start, start towards that star. And there, somehow God, in His sovereignty, would hide that star from others. And folks, I am telling you, you have to understand God is sovereign. God will give us every chance in the world to see His star. To see His star. And folks, we need to understand, folks, that's what Christian, or that's what Christmas is about. It's that shining light in a dark time. I don't think right now in American history there has ever been a darker time than we have now. People are groping in darkness. People are looking for light. People are looking for answers. People are hurting. People are crying out to God. And folks, we as Christians, we are that star. We are a reflection of that star. And people need to see that that light in our lives. And we also need to follow that star as the wise men did. Verse 10 says, And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. Now folks, they knew they were close. They knew they were on track. It's one of those things that, that you know, it would just well up inside of you. They could see uh, that they were very, very close. And I believe that the closer they got, the brighter that star God. Verse 11, and when they had come into the house, notice it wasn't the manger, it was a house. They had moved into a house and they saw the young child with Mary, his mother. They fell down and worshipped him. Think of who they are, folks. They were scholars. They were wealthy folks. Uh, They had traveled miles and miles and miles. They had had that hope in their lives. They had one thing when they set out on that journey. The one thing they had, they were focused in on finding the Christ child. And folks, I am telling you, the day that you received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior was the greatest day of your life. 
And folks, we need to share that with others. There could be people here today that don't know Christ, that have never asked for forgiveness of their sins and put their faith and trust in Christ. And what we are doing here today is, folks, we are worshiping God. We are worshiping and we are praising God and we are thanking God for the Christmas season. He is worthy of our worship. And when they had opened their treasures, they present, presented gifts to him. And the gifts were gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And folks, we all know how valuable gold is. It is extremely valuable. And I believe uh, that the reason they came that far was to give this the gifts to Joseph and Mary, and that would give them money, all right? They would have money to make that trip to Egypt, to live in Egypt for a while, and even fund the trip going back to Nazareth. Folks, God's got everything covered. God was going to take care of Jesus and take care of Mary and Joseph. And we know frankincense is a very ex uh, expensive incense. And many times it was used uh, to anoint bodies at death. And then myrrh was a perfume, a perfume, an expensive perfume. So we know all these gifts were very expensive. And to me, folks, uh, even as Christians, folks, we need to give our best to Jesus. We need to give our best. Then in verse 12, then being divinely warmed in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Folks, God told them. God told them, you know what? Herod's upset. He is extremely upset. And God told them, sometimes it's through an angel. Okay, sometimes, I, I know in my own life, folks, it's just a still, small voice. God tells me what I need to do. And folks, we as Christians need to always obey the word of God and the words from God. And they departed for their own country another way. Folks, sometimes in life, the shortcut, the short way is not the best way. Many times in our life, a God will take us the long way home. God will tell us and uh, allow us to go through things that sometimes do not make sense. But I'm telling you, folks, God will never let you down. God is always there to guide you. And these wise men uh, listen to the voice of God. You know, when it comes to true worship, folks, true worship will always produce joy in our hearts. Man, I love the Christmas season, folks. I love the song, Joy to the World. I love all the Christmas songs. I really can't pick out one. Uh, I don't love. We as Christians, in the month of December, and really, folks, we should have joy all year round, but true worship will produce joy. It'll produce humility. Notice the posture of these wise men. They came and knelt and worshiped Jesus. Folks, there's something about being on your knees before God. They were in the presence of God. It was God. Jesus was God in human flesh. And there was such a respect, such a aura, such a uh, just a sense of divinity and a sense of holiness when they came into that place. Folks, I cannot wait to get to heaven and see Jesus face to face. It will produce, folks, joy. It will produce humility. It will produce praise. It will produce praise. I'm telling you, that joy in your heart, uh, and, and a lot of times when I have that joy, songs just pop into my head. Christian songs, and especially uh, at uh, you know Christmas time. I love uh, when I'm traveling uh, to, to turn on Christmas music, and that Christmas music just brings joy to your heart. And true worship will also uh, produce giving 
and gratitude. Folks, wise men still seek Jesus. And we, as Christians, need to seek Jesus also. We need to sense his presence in our lives. Folks, the Holy Spirit speaks to us all the time. If you hear the voice of God this week, would you just obey? Would you just obey it? And he also gives us power. His Holy Spirit gives us power. And we need to seek not power for ourselves, but power to overcome sin. Power to have strength in difficult times. Power and uh, uh, Holy Spirit power to, that gives us boldness in our sharing. These things the wise men sought in the last thing. And, and folks, I think this is so important. It brought peace into their lives. Folks, I can tell you what's wrong. And I can tell you why there's no peace on earth and goodwill toward men. Because so many people do not have the peace of God in their lives. They're living for themselves. They're thinking that material things will make them happy. They're pouring their whole lives into jobs or vocations or, or things. And, and folks, things cannot make and produce peace and joy in your life. There's a certain joy that you have from being a Christian. Jeremiah 29, I close with this verse. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. Jeremiah 29, 11. The prophet Jeremiah says, For I know the thoughts that I think to you, says the Lord, the thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Folks, I am telling you, People want peace in their life. Peace in their life. People want to know uh, they have a solid future. Folks, according to the Word of God, everything's going to be all right. God's in control and hope. Folks, that hope is in Jesus Christ. Our hope is in Him. And then verse 12, then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. Folks, one way that we can seek God and seek Jesus is through prayer. Prayer is so important. Folks, I hope you wake up praying. I hope you go <clears throat> to bed praying. I hope when you wake up in the middle of the night, you are praying we have so many things to pray for, and prayer is so important uh, to our spiritual life. And then it says, And then you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Folks, he is saying we have to put our heart into worship. Our heart into worship. Folks, it's not just our head. It's not just thinking about it. It's truly blocking out everything around us and realizing the most important person in this room is the Holy Spirit. The most important uh, way to have peace in our lives is Jesus Christ Himself. We need to seek these things with all of our heart. Father, thank You for this day. and. God, I thank You that wise men still seek Him. God, I thank You for the divine guidance that You gave Mary and Joseph. The divine guidance that You gave the wise men. And God, I thank You for Your divine protection. God, even in this day and in this age, You protect us. You love us. You watch over us. You are with us. You are in us. You are for us. And God, I pray today we would truly worship You. Truly worship You. Not just go through another service. Not just give another invitation. God, I pray that our hearts would turn to worship. God, I pray that we would go back to that manger. That we would go back 
to that birth of Jesus Christ. God, He was born for us. He was born to die. And God, I pray that we would have gratitude in our hearts for who He is and what He has done. God, I pray if there's one here that doesn't know You, God, I pray that they would just come forward and just simply say, I want to accept Jesus into my life today. I just want to know that peace. I just want to know that love that God has for us. And God, it truly could be the best Christmas they've ever had. So God, I pray that your Holy Spirit be strong today. If there's others that need to rededicate their life to Christ, or join the church, or come for baptism, maybe they need to be scripturally baptized. God, I pray that you would just uh, influence them. Lord, speak to them. And God, we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory. Lord, man has not that power, God. It's you. It is you that draw men and women to you. And God, I pray it would be so during our time of invitation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?